Good morning and welcome to Fort Stormworks. I am your instructor for today, Captain Geronimo. You will be receiving basic instruction in the North American AT-6C Texan. So grab a chute and fall in on your assigned aircraft. Hurry up! So I'll pause the tutorial for a moment here. Uh, at this point, I did not have time to record uh, some of the other quirks and idiosyncrasies of the Weirway and the Harvard. So instead of uh, making an entire separate section of the video for that, I will just annotate their differences and changes at the bottom of the video. To the Aussies and Kiwis out there, my sincerest apologies. Let's get back to the action. Upon approaching our aircraft, the first thing we will need to do is clear any oil that's collected in the lower cylinders overnight. To do that, we'll pull the propeller through until we've counted six blades. One, two, three, four, five, and six. This process varies from aircraft to aircraft. We'll discuss that further at the end of this video. Located on each wing, there is a parachute. It is accessible from the cockpit while seated should you have forgotten to put it on prior to taking off. There's also a fire extinguisher accessible from the rear cockpit or from the ground. And on the left and right side of the fuselage, there are hidden buttons allowing you to open and close the cockpit canopies externally. Move into the front cockpit and strap yourself in. First thing we want to check is our fuel pressure. It reads zero. We're going to look at our fuel gauges, which are located on our left and right hip. There's 90% of the tank is full on the left side, and the right tank we have 95%. There is no cross-feed valve in the aircraft. We will need to select each tank uh, individually. To do that, we'll select the most full tank we have, which is the right tank, using the fuel tank selector. We also need to now pressurize the system. To do that, we're going to use the fuel hand pump, and we need to attain at least three pounds of pressure in the system. To do that, we'll pump the fuel hand pump roughly 12 times. And we now have 3.74 pounds of pressure in the system. We'll then turn on the battery and any required lighting. We'll turn on the navigation lights our magnetos, and now we need to prime the engine. A note on priming. The engine requires roughly between three and five pushes of this fuel primer. Anything more than five will likely foul the plugs and make it so the engine runs extremely rough. There is a process for clearing the engine while running. We'll discuss that further at the end of this video. For now, I will press the primer four times. One, two, three, four. I'm now going to energize the starter using the foot pedal. You'll hear the starter begin to energize. After a few seconds, release and engage the starter pedal. The engine will begin to turn over. The engine idles at roughly 600 RPM. To attain that initially, it's on the cold engine. We'll need to crack the throttle a little bit. You notice our engine is running a little rough. We have two processes for correcting this. We can either prime again. Again, do not exceed more than five presses. Or, what I'm going to do is move the throttle forward slightly until I attain uh, about a thousand RPM, at which point the engine will warm up a little bit and it should smooth out. There it goes. I'll now reduce our throttle back to idle. And once we're ready to go, we can begin taxi. I'm going to release the parking brake, advance the throttle. And using the left or right arrow keys, I can turn the aircraft. If I want to stop, I'm release the arrow keys and press and hold the tow brakes with the number two key. If I release the number two, I'll begin moving again. If you would like to ground loop, you can press and hold the left or right arrow key respectively, and then the number two key, and you will ground loop. This can be a little difficult to master. Go ahead, practice it now, and I'll catch up with you when you're ready for takeoff. All right, we've now centered ourselves up on the runway. We've received our clearance from the tower, and we're ready for takeoff. The next thing we'll need to do is pressurize the hydraulic system. The system is unique in that after two minutes, it'll automatically depressurize itself. To pressurize the system, we'll press the hydraulic power control, 
we should see a thousand pounds of pressure in the system. We can now use the flaps and raise and lower our landing gear. We're going to set our flaps using the three and four key and set it to roughly that first notch there. If you set the parking brake, you can now release it and we're ready for our takeoff. This aircraft behaves very uh, much like a large aircraft, very heavy. Uh, engine power, power is critical to safe and uh, operation of the aircraft. So you'll need to monitor it constantly. We're going to set our manifold pressure to roughly 30 inches and using our rudder pedals we'll keep ourselves as centered as possible on the runway to begin our takeoff run. Runs airborne, I will retract the flaps and the landing gear and continue with our climb out. There we go. I'm going to advance the manifold pressure up to about 30 inches. Set. Keeping ourselves centered on the runway using the left and right arrow keys. We can then pull back on the stick and we're airborne. I'm now going to press 5 and retract our landing gear and our flaps and begin a nice easy bang to the right. That may be a little steep. I'll catch up with you uh, in a minute once we're leveled off and we'll discuss cruising. All right, we're now cruising. And uh, as I mentioned, this aircraft uh, behaves like a very heavy aircraft. It is maneuverable and can perform uh, quite a few aerobatics, but if you're looking to uh, go cross country and conserve fuel, you'll need to dial back the engine as much as possible. Notated here and on most of the aircraft, there's a cart that we should set our manifold pressure at, which is 28.7 inches. So I'm gonna do that now. And this is about as economical as we can run the aircraft and maintain uh, level flight and also just sip on fuel. Throughout the flight, you'll need to keep an eye on the manifold pressure and the status of your engine. If you run the engine at high RPMs, you will overheat the engine. Uh, if you fly inverted for any length of time, the engine will attempt or will cut out. And more important, most important, we will need to monitor our fuel. We're drawing from our left tank currently, but I want to make sure I keep the aircraft balanced. So I'm going to switch over to our right tank. And we're now drawn from the right tank. As I mentioned before, there is no cross feed uh, between the two tanks. All right, next up is landing. I will uh, get back to you uh, in a moment uh, to discuss our landing. All right, we're into a very long, lazy base leg of our uh, final into the multiplayer island here, so we're gonna get the aircraft ready for uh, landing. First thing we need to do, pressurize that hydraulic system again, verify a thousand pounds, and we can lower the landing gear and the flaps. Move the flap uh, indicator all the way to the stop, and verify that we see the right tab on the left and right wings, verifying that our landing gear are down and locked. We're then going to turn into our final. Verify that we have are on the appropriate tank. We have more fuel in the left tank, so I'm going to select the left tank. And I'm going to back our uh, manifold pressure all the way off to 28 inches. And this will set us up on a nice, uh, maybe a little steep glide slope. And I'll catch up with you when we're uh, just about to hit the threshold. All right, we're about to come over the threshold now. Uh, I want to be ready for this. I'm gonna. You can attempt a three-point landing, but I'm gonna do a two-wheeled landing today. As soon as we hit the ground, I'm gonna pull back on the stick and keep flying the aircraft. Maintain that center line with left and right arrows, and come off the throttle. And the aircraft should uh, lower the tail on its own. Once our speed is decreased enough, I can start using the tow brakes uh, conservatively, but not too much so that I nose over. And when I'm ready, I can give it a little throttle and uh, exit the runway. All right, now that we're safely on the ground, we'll go over some of the quirks and idiosyncrasies of the aircraft. 
We'll start with the throttle. The front seat pilot has a notch in their throttle, which prevents them from moving the throttle inadvertently into the wartime emergency power zone. To do so, press and hold the up arrow, and once you hit that notch, keep pressing for roughly two seconds. After you move into the wartime emergency power zone, it'll be indicated by the red. You'll notice a rapid increase in your fuel consumption, an increase in your performance, and after two minutes, the engine will overheat, and if you do not reduce power quickly, explode. There is also a buzzer attached to the throttle, which warns you if the gear are up. If you reduce power below 27 inches manifold pressure, uh, you'll hear that buzzer, again, if the gear remain up. Moving on to the heater. Uh, in the North American Texans, the heater is eh, decent. Uh, it will keep you warm, uh, but barely. Uh, in the weir way, uh, it's practically non-existent. It'll stop you from freezing, uh, but it won't let you get any warmer. And in the Harvards, the heater is actually pretty good. Uh, it'll work quite well at keeping you warm in Arctic conditions. However, in the case of all aircraft, if the canopies are open, uh, the heater won't work at all. Uh, and the radio... Uh, if you have it in the inner phone selector position, which is off, uh, when you go to communicate, you'll communicate with the pilot in the back. If you move it to radio or on, uh, you'll transmit over the radio. Uh, the pilot and the rear pilot will hear your transmissions, uh, but you will be unable to communicate with them until you return it to interphone. Moving into the back seat, we'll talk about some of the idiosyncrasies back there. In the back seat, you can see the rear pilot has a much more limited forward visibility. He also has a much more limited uh, gauge cluster, and he lacks uh, quite a few controls that are available in the front seat. Uh, he can stop the engine, but he can't start it. In the case of the hydraulics, he can charge the system. He can raise and lower the flaps, uh, but he can only lower the landing gear, and he has no indicator showing uh, what position any of these uh, control surfaces or landing gear are in. He can still select the fuel tank. He still has gauges and he still has the regular uh, radio controls available in the front seat. And that uh, concludes most of the quirks uh, in the Texans and Harvards. There are a few others, we'll cover those uh, momentarily. All right, we've traded out our Texan for a Weirway, and we'll go over some of the quirks on this aircraft. We'll start with the starter. Uh, it's functionally the same as the starters on the other aircraft, uh, but implemented differently. There isn't a pedal uh, in between your legs. Uh, to energize the starter, turn the switch on, you'll hear the starter spool up, and after a couple seconds, you can turn the switch off, and the engine will kick over and start, just like the other Texans and Harvards. The only other aircraft that implements this switch is the Royal New Zealand Air Force uh, Texan. Other than that, they all use the pedal. The one thing that does separate this aircraft from the others is that it doesn't have a fuel primer plunger. Uh, you'll have to use the throttle. To do so, press this triangular button down, and then using your up and down arrow keys, Move the throttle through its full motion uh, three to five times. So that was two, three, four, and then five. And if I had pressurized the fuel system, the engine would now be primed and ready for starting. And that concludes all our quirks uh, on the different aircraft. All right, thank you for joining us for this tutorial. I hope you found it informative and useful. Uh, all these aircraft I was able to obtain their real manuals for and tried to duplicate as many of the systems and idiosyncrasies from the real aircraft into the Stormworks version. Uh, they are difficult to fly, and it was said of the real Texan, if you could fly a Texan, you could fly anything. So I hope that after flying these, you find all the other beautiful aircraft on the workshop uh, <laughs> easy to fly. Thank you, and have a nice day.